one of the first things that I noticed about my generation and why I decided to write this book in terms of being radically countercultural, I noticed that we were resurrecting fashion trends from the 1990s. We were resurrecting music from the 1990s mm-hmm. and maybe even before. The only TV shows that we binge watch over and over and over again are either set in decades past, look at Stranger Things being in the 1980s, very nostalgic, yeah. or they actually are from decades past. The number one TV show for years and years among our generation has been Friends or or we rewatch The Office or Seinfeld and love and crave this idea of a time where you could just exist when not everything was this very divisive partisan political statement. I mean, now, gosh, you brush your teeth in the morning and that brand of toothbrush is saying, I support this political party. <laughs> the brand of underwear that you're wearing yeah, right now, yeah. especially if it's Calvin Klein, is I support this ideology and this particular direction for America. <laughs> Freaking out, not only because you're here in my studio, which somehow you've only been to once for know, about no 30 seconds <laughs> before. That seems very bizarre, but I'm holding your book in my hand, which comes out this week, The End of the Alphabet, How Gen Z Can Save America, forward by Dave Rubin. And we do a show together Monday through Thursday at 1 p.m., People of the Internet, and you're here, and your fiancé is my social media guy, Brock. There's a lot of worlds colliding right now. How are you feeling about life I and all that good stuff? I'm so happy, Dave. <laughs> it is so surreal, actually, like, sitting in here, because I see this through my screen every day, but it looks a lot different in real life. The three-dimensional thing definitely is a little thrown off. Well, but I'm so excited, and we've had such a fun year together working on so many different projects. Yeah. I am so happy to see your name on that book cover and so grateful that you've taken the time to write such a beautiful foreword. Well, I'm actually honored that you asked me to do it and we shouldn't just sit here giving platitudes about each other. But I, so great. No, <laughs> you are great. And I wrote some very nice things about you because I think one of the first times we met, we, we met a couple times over the years, usually at Turning Point mm-hmm. things, but I remember specifically, and I write it about uh, in in the forward, I remember sitting with you. Do you remember the date on that one? We were July, outdoors at that turning point thing. Ju- uh, July twenty twenty one. July twenty. I think it was twenty twenty one or twenty twenty two. Yeah, something like that. And I remember you interviewed me. And afterwards, I wanted to make a point of saying to you that you were an excellent interviewer because you are an excellent interviewer. And I feel like nobody has an attention span anymore. And I was Hmm. like, oh, she's listening to me and asking the right follow-up question and pleasant and all of those things. And I'm used to so many robots doing it on the other side of all of this. That's not a question. It's just a compliment. And now we'll get to the hardcore questions. Well, thank you. I love it. And you were a good sport that day because I made you sit outside in Florida in July. (laughs) It was extremely hot. Um, Well, all right. First off, I guess for, for anyone that's watching this that has no idea who you are, Who are you Mm -hmm. and what's going on with this generation? How do you decide to write a book about Gen Z? Yeah, uh, my name is Isabel Brown. I am an independent content creator. And I like to say I wear a ton of different hats. It's way too much for me to tell you what I do with all of the things that I do every day. But it all comes down to one thing. And for a living, I get up and I tell people the truth every day, be that a 15 second TikTok video or a three hour live stream, a book or a speech or anything in between. I never thought this would be my career or what I wake up and I'm so so happy to do every day. I was actually pre-med, as you know, Dave, yeah. in college, and I have two degrees in biomedical sciences. So obviously life went in a very, very different direction. But it stemmed from that love of truth, really. That's why I loved science growing up. I was so obsessed with understanding how the world works and and asking the biggest questions about the universe, using data and evidence to prove that there was an objective reality. And then I was really disappointed in my college experience to find that that just isn't the case about science in academia anymore. Anymore. Long story short, really inspired me to find people who shared my values of critical thinking and objective morality and this idea that objective truth still exists in a world where my truth is different from your truth. Uh, got involved in politics along the way and started posting videos on the internet instead of medical school. <laughs> it's the great American story for, for a Gen Z person, except that a Gen most Gen Z people usually, or at least if we were to um, kind of look at it from the way most people understand the world over the last five or 10 years, most Gen Z people, kids, 
shift the other way. Mm-hmm. So what was it that was causing you to always go in the right direction? Were you always going in the right direction? I think it's Did important you flirt to with note, the crazy people. Oh, of course. And always just for fun. I yeah. always like to poke the bear, Dave. Yeah. You know that about me. But I think it's important to note Generation Z starts in what most experts say is 1997. So I was born in May of 1997. I'll be 27 in a couple months, which is exciting. And it goes down to those born in 2012. So when we're talking about Gen Z, we're talking about mostly preteens, teenagers, and up to middle 20-somethings. I started college at a time where millennials were on the way out and right in the thick of all of it when Antifa was coming onto the scene. I've had many a good run-in with them great in people, my own state people. of Colorado. They're good good people at the end of the day. Uh, when people were lighting their college campuses on fire because people like Ben Shapiro or Dennis Prager were coming to give a speech about freedom of speech on a college campus, which is just insane. And so I was watching the ideas and the values and this political notion of socialism unfold from millennials when I was starting my college campus experience. By the time I left, it was a totally different atmosphere and totally different environment. I remember thinking, I don't know if this is because of the work we're doing with activism on campus and bringing these speakers and facilitating these conversations, or it's a totally different generation that's younger and, and coming up into the fold. But either way, it's an exciting time. And working as a content creator and doing the research I've done for this book, I've come to discover that many people are attributed the values and ideas and behaviors of millennials, this idea that you're lazy and entitled and the participation trophy group, the people who scream at the sky when Donald Trump becomes elected president, uh, the blue-haired socialists, if you will, they're attributing that to Generation Z, even though we are fundamentally juxtaposed as generations. We have very different values and very different perspectives. Do you think that's partly, we've talked about this a little bit before on people on the internet, partly because Gen X, the, the old timers like me, Gen X and then the millennials that you were just off, as you mentioned, you were just a few months off of being a millennial technically, seemingly haven't taken over when they're supposed Mm. to take over. So we're still dealing with Biden and Trump and all of these boomers who refuse to retire, refuse to give up the reins. So the people that are kind of supposed to be in charge now aren't, meaning the Xers. And then that leaves it being very easy. This is why when we do the show, I'm always telling you, I don't want to just endlessly make fun of these people. Of course, we can make fun of all the blue hair (laughs) people, but I'm sympathetic to them because it's the it's the people before them that have failed them. So I see like a a generational tension here that has led to sane people like you, actually. Yeah, I I think part of it is who's pulling the levers of power in Washington. Sadly, it's not even Gen X. It's it's baby boomers that are still pulling the levers of power. But I think a lot of it it is also the fact that the world keeps moving faster and faster and faster. And with the dawn of technology, I think older generations have a hard time realizing that we are 20 years out from the 1990s and this glorious utopia that everybody lived through. It's a totally different earth that we live on today. We have different values. We get our news in a different way. We're interacting with each other in a different way. We have different TV shows and fashion sense and everything. And I break all of that down in the book. Uh, But also, it's just a different time. And and I think it's time to have a different conversation because of all of that. So they kind of lump millennials and Gen Z all in together, thinking we're still dealing with the issues of the late 90s, early 2000s. We're not. It is a totally different world. And we all know that. But I don't think we often take the time to sit back and analyze everything that has happened in the last 20, 30 years. Do the Gen Zers uh, sit back and watch Friends and think, because I know Friends <laughs> is big with you guys now, apparently, and think, boy, I I did miss something that was a little more sane. It's hard to know what sanity was if you grew up in an insane time. If that's mm. all you know, it's, the, it's Plato's cave in a way. It's hard to know what sanity was if you grew up in an insane time. I love that. Yes. And actually, that's one of the first things that I noticed about my generation and why I decided to write this book in terms of being radically countercultural. I noticed that we were resurrecting fashion trends from the 1990s. We were resurrecting music from the 1990s mm-hmm. and maybe even before. The only TV shows that we binge watch over and over and over again are either set in decades past, look at Stranger Things being in the 1980s, very nostalgic, yeah. or they actually are from decades past, the number one TV show for years and years among our generation has been friends, or we rewatch The Office or Seinfeld and, and love and crave this idea of a time where you could just exist when not everything was this very divisive partisan political statement. I mean, now, gosh, you brush your teeth in the morning and that brand of toothbrush is saying, I support this political party. <laughs> the brand of underwear that you're wearing yeah, right now, yeah. especially if it's Calvin Klein, is I support this ideology and this particular direction for America. I think I'm wearing Lulu underwear, which they've been kind of squishy you know, on this we'll stuff, right? It. I know. It's better 
I know, but the underwear is good. It breathes. What can I tell you? <laughs> and their founder is is okay in that, so we'll take it. But I, oh, has he come around? Because remember, at he first was they always were always oh he pretty was conservative, but oh, they okay. pushed him out. So he's coming around publicly now, saying all this, but he doesn't control the. Company well, don't worry. Anymore. I just steal these when I go to the stores in New York. That's so all right. It's totally fine. You're not even breaking the law, Dave. Yeah. Look at you, you good law abiding citizen. So I think. When we look at something like the 1990s, right, or even aspects of the 70s and 80s and the early 2000s, we see this image either through the stories we hear from our parents or the media that we're consuming or the fashion that we're trying to resurrect. And we're seeing a time where you could just exist, when you could have a friend that you disagreed with, when you could freely practice your religion and people didn't think you were this evil bigot, when you could go to school and it wasn't always about what the president said that morning. And we're longing for a time where we could just have peace unity, an objective sense of reality and common morals again, when it didn't always have to feel like that was predicated on your political party. If you're looking for more honest and thoughtful conversations about politics instead of nonstop screaming, check out our politics playlist. And if you want to watch full interviews on a variety of topics, watch our full episode playlist all right over here. And to get notified of all future videos, be sure to subscribe and click the notification bell.